So here we might never find out. It'll go up here and complete. Whoa, there went my dice boot. I'll get that in a second. And um, that's it. We are, we are, come here, dice boot. Oh, it went on oh, course. <laughs> with the maximum distance, so I gotta get up and get it. There we go. Better. Welcome. So, I've pulled out the alternative map in Atlantic Chase. We have a new scenario where the Germans are going, ah, okay, okay, I'm just kidding. This, of course, is bayonets and tomahawks. French and Indian War, of course. All right. And it, don't worry, Atlantic Chase is still over there, and I'm still going to run some stuff there. But I wanted to get this on the table somewhere and show it. Uh, I don't see a whole lot of videos on YouTube. I see some after action reports. I see about a half a dozen unboxing uh, <laughs> videos, but I, did, I haven't seen anyone really just say, okay, here's where this is, this is, this is, this is what we do here, this is, this is this part of the action phase, dot, 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 dot. So I thought I'd go through one of these. Uh, this one will be just kind of an over, first video will just be kind of an overview and maybe just set up and things like that. I don't want to go too long here. Um, and I want to also wanted to do it because I have the feeling some people, like me, were having a little trouble grokking it. And if you are one of those people, I recommend grabbing the playbook, flipping to page 34, and reading the design notes. Because once I read that and saw where the designer's head was at, a lot of it started to just click into place with the combat. Um, especially when it gets into... Impossible. If you're ever an uh, Axis and Allies fan, you'll sometimes sit there and go, well, wait a minute, why is this one little infantry unit fighting off five tanks and 12 fighters and, and whatnot? Um, but this game pr proposes it a little different, where you can get plausible results uh, for that without it being, as he says, supernatural. I can give you kind of an overview here. Uh, triangles, squares, and circles. Triangles represent the light skirmisher units. That includes Indians as well. And the squares are your trained brigades. Uh, brigades, brigades. Uh, circles for infantry. We also have fleets. We also have forts. We have fortresses. And various uh, units that way. And then there's distinguishing things like Metropolitan Brigade. There's, uh, where is that? There's brigades with the um, commander logo on them. And that's uh, commanders bring in re-rolls uh, re in battle and things like that. But I think part of my problem when I first approached this, so if we had, um, is that my hair in the video? I hope not. Let me see. Okay. Here's the British. They're brown and red. As opposed to white and, well, green for the Indians. And here we go. There's 44th and the 48th Brigade. There's their cannon, same thing. Here's forts, whatever. Okay. And I was sitting there thinking, hmm, what is this like? Uh, maybe uh, rock, paper, scissors. This guy is strong against this, but this guy is strong. No, no, no. As the designer says, this is... Round peg goes into round hole, uh, which basically means that like damages like. So, when you're rolling, you'll what you do is you'll set up all your guys. Oh, let me, well, let me get let me get into what a battle is. If you go over here, you'll have attacker and defender, and they'll start at the zero. They might have some battle penalties. Uh, they don't actually start scoring hits until they get into the positive column. Uh, but basically, you roll the dice for each unit, and that's what the designer calls a bucket of dice, dice approach, where every unit gets to roll, even if they got hit, uh, which is like in a lot of games. And after everyone is rolled, whoever is ahead on this um, chart is the winner on this track. And if it's like three ahead, there's there's route rules and, and so on. But when you get down to it, we have to get back to this whole like like hits like. So we you would group up the battle wherever you're... There's, there's no actual battle board here. 
Um, so you just put them on the map and remember where they went. You group them up by type, triangles, you just match up the shapes, and then you roll each shape, and it's, there's a whole priority order and things like that. And so you'd start with these, and you'd match it up. And in this case, I love these custom dice. There you go. Triangle, circle. It's triangle. So this potential, if I, this was a guy, guy rolling, this guy would potentially hit this uh, unit. Uh, if they're in the negative column, they wouldn't. They would just advance the uh, the track. And like say for that, that would be a miss because it doesn't match any of the it doesn't match the shape here. It does match this shape if he was rolling, that would be a hit. And so it's triangle, circle, square, circle, and obviously the circles would hit each other. Uh, there's the miss, and this is has to do with uh, commander rerolls and fatality, but basically it's a miss for everyone. There's bayonets and tomahawks. This will is for mainly for brigade. I think fleets also have a, and artillery have a, a status effect or something like that. But mainly you're gonna this will hit militia. Militia are, yeah, you can't really see right there, but you'll see two silhouettes of. Uh, soldiers right there so this uh space has two militia and this would eliminate militia they actually get added to the battle where is those ah i'll worry about it later and finally the universal role these flags there's two of them i think two flags don't hit anything but they do advance the marker so let's say that wasn't even there And he was rolling. He cannot actually do damage to this guy, but he can still contribute to the battle by rolling a flag and advancing the track marker here. Now, this is where I wanted to kind of get into the notes. And we call it, I'll start with a universal flag, a universal result face, flag icon. The flag icon featured on two die faces is the basic role that is successful for all unit types. It represents good maneuvering or anything else that contributes to victory. Thus, and this is important, thus a 300 man light piece has the same basic chance that a 1500 man brigade of, contribu of contributing to the battle outcome. Far from being supernatural, it reflects the impact light troops had in the North American theater out of proportion to their numbers. And I'll continue geometric pegboard approach where I said, you know, square peg goes in the square hole. Now, how to create a system that reflect actual battle losses of the mid 18th century North American theater. By compiling detailed statistics of all skirmishes and battles of the French and Indian War, I was able to reflect in a single custom die the lethality of very different unit types from light troops to ships. The result? Two hit faces and one bayonets and tomahawks B and T face for chrome specific to the unit type. Example: the effect of artillery on infantry. In that particular era and theater, a given unit type is best suited to inflict losses on units of a similar type: line infantry, line infantry versus line infantry, light troops versus light troops, ships versus ships. An approach based on kids geometric pegboard game facilitates that units are of three distinct shapes triangle square or circle and the two hit faces each have two of those shapes circle is on both faces for the more powerful artillery fleets and forts to hit a battling unit's role must match its own shape and there must be an enemy unit of the same shape to receive the hit with such a system, the huge size difference between certain unit types does not distort battle results as different unit types cannot hit each other. Of course, there are exceptions such as artillery, ambushes, etc. That's where the chrome or BNT die face and battle relevant card events come in handy. Does it translate into battlefield reality of the period? Yes. The data confirms that skirmishers did not mow down entire battalions. And, of course, they will remain dispersed or in cover when facing battalions, rendering volley fire ineffective against them. The few casualties that occur when a brigade faces a light unit does not justify flipping either unit to its reduced face. 
That were re would represent a loss of 750 men for a brigade of, or 150, 300 men for a light unit. For example, Wolfe's thin red line of 3,000 men at Quebec's battle in 1759 received fire from several, for several hours from 1,000 French and indigenous skirmishers' positions on its flanks. Still, these redcoats eventually delivered the perfect volleys that broke the French regulars coming on their front. Either we let go of the post-Napoleonic paradigm of high casualty rates in linear battle or start believing in 18th century zombies. Now, if light units cannot hit brigades, how does the game simulate an event such as Braddock's army's elimination, quote, by skirmishers at the Monongahela battle in July 1755? The 1,200 to 1,500 men of the British force, equivalent to one brigade and one light unit, were against 900 French and indigenous skirmishers, equivalent to three light units. No artillery unit involved, the British cannons were left behind, except for a few lighter guns. Assuming the British player rolled no applicable result with his two battle rolls, example, a square circle hit and a miss, and the French player rolled three valid results, example, two flags and a triangle circle hit, the British would be routed. So even though no light French light unit could normally hit the British brigade, the latter is eliminated by route's mandatory loss of one unit. The total of British losses, a 1,500-man brigade plus half of a 600-man light unit, comes m much higher than the 1,000 casualty casualties actually inflicted to the British in that battle. But historically, the surviving British regulars fell back all the way to Philadelphia, setting up winter quarters there. In August, they vanished from operations, so to speak. That game result is even more realistic if we take into account that an eliminated brigade might come back and play at winner's quarter step number eight. In comparison, the French and their indigenous allies historically suffered 40 casualties in that same battle, not enough to justify flipping any of the three light units involved in it to its reduced face. Braddock's defeat in 1755 thus represents an extreme case where all went wrong. At the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, Carillon's Ticonderoga, an expected French victory of 1758, where all goes exceedingly well against all odds, and the indomitable Abadis card, number 41 event, is necessary for that outcome. Okay, that's enough reading for now. I know that was a lot to go through, but it gives you exactly what he's trying to do, is make a battle system that can yield up some plausible results. And I think he's done that quite well. Uh, and so with that in mind, I think I'm gonna go ahead and start showing how this works. So I'm gonna set up, let's start with a scenario one. And scenario, there's four scenarios, there's, um, 1755, we call this Vaudreuil's, I'm going to butcher French like you, you've never seen, Vaudreuil's Petite, petite Gueule in 1755, that's the first scenario, second Loudon's Gamble, Gamble, 1757, Amherst Juggernaut, 1758, 1759 is scenario three, and then scenario four is actually French and Indian full, full campaign, which is basically all three scenarios kind of put together with some connecting uh, mechanics. Now, I love this setup. Uh, I, I, I think other war games do this more and more. If you, yeah, quite frankly, if you got if you're building a board game and you don't have here, because basically all you do is like. Okay, I need that unit there. Okay, where is it? Like that. And that. All right, so let me get through all this with a little magic. And there we are. A nice little sheet. All the units, the pictures on the units match. They're the same size and they all fit on there very nicely. And once you've collected them all, now it's just a matter of going one by one. And here's the little, it says what, where the space is, and it points a little arrow at it. Oh my gosh, how helpful this is, opposed to war games, 
where you got to read the book in here. It says, okay, this unit is in hex 0483. And you're just sitting there. Oh my God. Where's my magnifying glass? Yeah. If you have a game where you have just these individual named units and things like that, and you don't have one of these little sheets to set it all up, I'm calling the police. You belong in jail. Now, come on. Do something like this. This is great. This gets it set up. And in fact, let's go ahead and just go speed this up. Boom. French are ready to go in almost no time at all. Easy, easy, easy setup. Um, also, you notice this, you're kind of like, okay, where I can't really get my bearings here because the map is kind of, the perspective is turned in a kind of way. I actually like this. Because I sit over here as the French, and he sits over there as the British, and you can see all your French, these home spaces, everything in blue here, is all kind of like here. And the enemy is over here. Point towards enemy this way. Mm -hmm. I like that. So after we set up this, and actually we do go through the same process with the British. Voila! And before I go ahead and put these on the board, I, I'll point out uh, these are the units that start on the map. And yeah, same with the French there. And this is our counter pools. And we're going to get gonna, that comes into with the reinforcements. And get a little draw bag here, which we will put tokens in and draw them out as for our reinforcements. And who doesn't like a game with a draw bag? Okay, so let's go ahead and get these up. All right, they're on the board. And finally, the Indians. And these Indians actually play on the French. There are some British ones here. Uh, very briefly, the, here's the Iroquois Confederacy. Here's the Cherokee. And there's cards that bring them into play for one side or the other. The other rule is the second any side violates uh, the territory, the Indians join, immediately join the other side permanently. So, well, let's get these guys up. And there we go. The counters are all set up. Uh, the scenario places we're going to have a victory point track. That's basically, there's no zero, so one side is winning or the other side is, is or the other side is. And it goes from, it's a single track there for both sides. You know, it's a push-pull, I guess you would call that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is and this is actually kind of the introduction to uh the action rounds uh, action rounds will start the year here 1755 we're starting the early ones and each year has nine action rounds with three kind of reinforcement uh, uh cleanup uh, phases as it were in the first part this is a, this is a, uh, I want to call this semi-card driven game. This is not like, um, like say Wilderness War or Paths of Glory where you have managed chance. In fact, I should say that right now, talk about the solo ability. This one is so, okay, well, let's talk about the three kinds of solo experiences. Uh, one I would call the full AI, the full solo bot uh, games, um, where it's like huge flow charts and just a very detailed procedure that basically takes all serious decisions out of the player's hands and, and directs it like that. And you go get some people really like that. They want a full, a really granular, uh, solo game or solo bot that really handles any kind of decision-making, uh, to the, to the, um, AI or bot. Uh, that's the, that's the, that is the most soloable, I guess they, you would call it. Then there's kind of this, uh, then on the other end of the spectrum is basically non, not really designed technically for solo, but it can be played like if it's a two player game and it's really just, I'm going to make the best moves for this side. Okay. Now I'm over to the other side. I'm going to make the best moves here. This one is kind of leans heavily towards that. And that's why I wanted to uh, point that out here. Because if you're one of those guys that really are looking for a solo experience and a fully realized uh, solo AI, this game is not it. 
yeah, I think you would be uh, disappointed with it because it's uh, the salt. All it has is it says this game is soloable, two player, and it does have some a few caveats for doing solo, but it's a little short list. Okay, uh, you don't pick two cards; you'll only pick one, and, and things like that. Uh, there's a middle ground. There's kind of the middle ground, which is uh, Atlantic Chase and other games over there, and that's kind of like that's kind of my sweet spot. I would say is where there is a you know a pretty robust AI, but it leaves a lot of the um, kind of the fill in work. Uh, to you, so it'll give you kind of a like the AI's. Okay, I want to do this. this is going to be my strategy. I'm going to leave it up to you to implement it in the best way possible. So that's kind of the middle ground. This is more towards the uh, I'll play the best I can on for this side. Okay, I'm now I'm on this side and I'll play the best I can for this. Yeah, I just wanted to make that note there. So um, that's how we're going. But it is a lot. I got to say it's a lot better than say um uh, say like Wilderness War. Or, you know, all those card-driven games where you're ha managing hands. And there it just gets really tr tricky to sit there and pretend, well, I don't know that he ha I have to pretend I don't know he has this card. And you get into things like that. There are people who have tried to make uh, solo systems with that. Like, uh, you can check out uh, Stuka Joe, who's made kind of a random card flipping uh, system. It's okay. I've tried it with a few games like uh, Labyrinth and... Yeah, uh, Paths of Glory and Wilderness and War. It's, it's, you know, and they, they're oh, I think some people really get a kick out of those. I have a little trouble with it. I think it's just too much. Uh, I can't. I can't explain it. It's just not my thing. So I tend to like to either find games with solo. I don't have to have the granular ones. I think those end up becoming kind of a procedural headache, where you're just uh, da, 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 and just just executing their move. Is just such a chore. That's why I think I re resonate so strongly with Atlantic Chase, where it's just giving me a strategy, and I just okay. It's obvious I need to go here, and that's the the only obvious move there, and things like that. So that's that's kind of where I sit. But I do like I don't mind doing a little uh, two player solo style. Uh, anyway, back to the after that long rant, um, we'll have two decks here. And the first deck is just six cards. It's called the build-up phase. The first three action rounds are build-up. And if we can look at a card here. It's a French card, of course. And you'll see this dice here. That's going to be for initiative, just deciding who's going first and whatnot. And these are your basically your actions you can do for that card, and that's going to be your action round. And this is an action round for a light unit and an action round for a... Uh, what do you call them? Brigade unit also includes uh, sail movement as well. And then cards will have various symbols on it like that. So, and of course the British have their own. So, and the first, before you even set up, we'll shuffle them up here. And before the game is even started, you're going to pull two. And you're going to pick the one you want and discard the other. Uh, go ahead and pick that one. And we put it on our... And, okay, this uh, the footprint of this game is pretty good. I can, This is a small square table, folding table, $40 you can get at Walmart. It's bad. It's actually, I like it a lot. Uh, but they want... You know, he has he has the layout where you have a bunch of cards up here. Obviously, I don't have that. Uh, so I'm just kind of squeezing it in here and kind of using the blank spots on the map here for, for the So I'll put my reserve card here. And the British will do the same. All right, oh, a lot of actions on one, but there's also and there's a little event uh, text that gives you special bonuses and whatnot. I'll get it there in the camera better. And so, mm, I think I'll, I'll keep going with the extra movement on it. And I'll put it in the Atlantic Ocean there, since I don't have anywhere else to put it. Footprints, footprints, I like games with footprints. Okay. 
that is the setup. Everything is ready to go at this point, and we are ready to begin action round one. But I think I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Hopefully, all these uh, and these uh, introductory notes are good. I, I apologize. I kind of hemmed and hawed a lot. I like I said, I just improvise these. I don't really know what I'm going to say when I do this, and so I, I beg pardon when I'm sitting there trying to trying to nail down my thoughts. But in any case, thanks for watching.